so hello and welcome to this University of Leicester PG Spotlight session on heritage and culture from the School of Arts. My name is Alicia, I'm the UK Postgraduate Recruitment Officer here at the University. I'll be the host for today's session and my colleague Sam is on hand in the chat function to organise or arrange any questions that you might have. So please just take a moment to familiarise yourself with the team's layout. The chat function is located in the top part of your screen, so feel free to click on that. Say hello, let us know where you're joining from and maybe a bit about what you're looking for from today's session. So I'm joined by staff today from, from English, History of Art and Film and Modern Languages. And we're going to be exploring what Master's Study and Beyond is like at the University of Leicester. Just so you know, these sessions are being recorded um, and you'll also be able to watch them back online shortly after the session. So just to get started, I'm going to hand over to our panel uh, and introduce themselves to introduce themselves with their name, a bit about their role uh, and something interesting about their work or perhaps area of research. So Emma, am I OK to start with you? Sure. Thanks, Alicia. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Emma Parker, Associate Professor of English and I'm Director of Postgraduate Teaching. I'm also the Director of the MA in Modern and Contemporary Literature. So I work on 20th century and contemporary literature um, and I specialise in um, gender and sexuality, particularly women's writing. So that's me. That's great. Thank you, Emma. Claire, I'm going to hand over to you next. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Claire Jenkins. I'm the director of our MA in Film and Film Cultures. I'm a lecturer in Film and Television Studies here at the University of Leicester. Uh, my research is focused particularly on popular film and television um, in, in Britain and America. Uh, by current research, I am writing and researching women directors who have made over $100 million at the American domestic box office. So that is the marker in Hollywood of a mega hit. So this is about women who have had kind of commercial success, but maybe aren't always explored um, in, in kind of scholarship because they're kind of making mainstream films. Things like Alvin and the Chipmunks, The Squeakwell is one of the, uh, the films that a woman directed that made a lot of money. Um, and in line with that, actually, I've just hosted a conference here at the University of Leicester in association with the British Association of Film and Television and Screen Studies that explored um, Penny Marshall's film Big. You might know it with Tom Hanks. Um, it's just had its 35th anniversary this month, actually. Um, and she was the first woman who made that 100 million at the box office. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that, Claire. That's, that's super interesting to know. And, and Ahmed, I'll hand over to you next. Oh, hi, uh, my name is Ahmed Al Imam and I'm Associate Professor in Translation Studies. I'm also the Director of the MA in, in Translation and Interpreting. And my areas of research cover uh, literary translation between Arabic and English, Quran translation from Arabic into English, uh, translation and ideology, and the cultural turn in translation studies. We'll talk a little bit more later on about uh, the structure of the MA and uh, what you should get from it. That's great. That's Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, so the first kind of question I'm going to sort of put to our panel today is just to tell our audience maybe about some research themes or topics or areas that recent master students have looked into. So, um, Emma, I know you've got a few programmes within your school, so I'll hand over to you to kind of to kick things off, if that's OK. So we offer four MAs in English, the MA in English Studies, the MA in Victorian Studies, the MA in Modern and Contemporary Literature and an MA in Creative Writing. So um, to start with the MA in English Studies, this is a programme for students who are interested in literature pre-1900, although you can do this MA if you want to work on 19th or 20th century or 21st century literature. But it's it's less specialised than the MA in Victorian Studies in the Modern and Contemporary Lit programme. Um, so recent examples of um, dissertations on the MA uh, in English Studies include Chaucer and Medieval Astrology, The Melancholic Male in William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet and Macbeth, The Magdalene House in 18th Century Literature, Queer Shakespeare in Bollywood, and this year, one of the most exciting dissertations that we're supervising is on Yiddish folklore. And um, it looks at representations of um, demonic characters in, in Jewish literature. 
Um, and one of the distinguishing features of the MA in English studies is that you can do a longer dissertation. So all the other dissertations have, a, all the other MAs have a dissertation that's 15,000 words. But if you do English studies, you can choose to do a 20,000 word dissertation. So it's a really excellent preparation for students who are particularly interested in going on to do a PhD. Um, MA in Victorian studies is obviously for people interested in 19th century literature um, and some recent dissertation topics. I really love these. The beard and the construction of Victorian masculinity, representations of Indian commodities in Victorian art and culture, China through the eyes of female Victorian travel writers, the corset and Victorian maternity, the cultural afterlives of Victorian murderesses and the seaside in working class uh, in the Victor the seaside of the Victorian working class. I'd love to read all of those dissertations. I think they sound great. And as you, you can probably get a sense from those titles of the global range of Victorian studies. And that grows out of the Victorian studies research seminar, which is called Global Victorians. So this MA doesn't just focus on English literature, it has a really global perspective. Um, one student on uh, the MA in uh, Victorian studies, Azza Hussain, she did her dissertation on, um, it was called Suffering from Nightmares, reading Dickens in the context of early 19th century nightmare theories. So she did a dissertation on Victorian nightmares, which is a great topic. And students on this MA collaborated with PhD students last year to run a conference um, called Victorian Discovery. And the whole conference, which was international and open to people from all over the world, it was online. It was organized by our students. And um, as a presented work from her MA dissertation at that conference, she did an amazing job and, and she really enjoyed it. The MA in Modern and Contemporary Literature, which is the one uh, that I'm the director of, um, students on this MA also come up with amazing topics, really interesting and exciting topics for their dissertations. Recently, we've supervised dissertations on subjects such as cold cases in crime fiction, trans in young adult fiction, fan fiction, recipes in contemporary women's writing, human animal relationships in the South African novel, refugees in contemporary drama. Um, and a student last year uh, called Sanem Alti, she did her dissertation on the representation of Istanbul in fiction. And she was so successful that she was awarded funding uh, to do a PhD and she's now doing a PhD on Turkish women's writing. Um, so those are some really exciting um, topics that have led to great opportunities. The MA in Creative Writing. Well, students on this module are phenomenally successful. Our creative writing students have won dozens and dozens of prize and are every year are shortlisted for creative writing prizes. One of our most successful students is called Laura Besley. And she's recently been shortlisted for the brilliant Flash Fiction Contest. That's this year, 2023, and the inaugural Welking Writing Prize. So Laura is already, as a student, an MA student, making a name for herself as a successful writer with the support um, of the tutors on the MA. And Laura is, um, uh, along with all many students on the MA in Creative Writing, presented their work this year at um, the university's literature festival. It's called Literary Leicester. It's the country's only free literature festival. It's open to everyone. It's not just for people at the university. We have regularly, every year, we have top name writers like Sarah Waters, Alan Hollinghurst, Carol Ann Duffy, um, it, it's it's an amazing event and our students have read their work alongside these leading leading writers. So the, the these are just some of the incredible opportunities that are open to our master's students.
That's amazing. Honestly, Emma, it's so wonderful to hear about the, the breadth of work um, across these programmes, but also how some of these courses are, and titles have, have sort of springboarded individuals into these amazing awards and conference environments. Um, it, it kind of shows how much a, a master's study at Leicester can really elevate um, what you're interested in in your career as well. Absolutely, yeah. That's really lovely to share. So thank you for that. Um, Clara, I'm going to hand over to you next, if that's OK. Similar question, maybe some topics or areas that perhaps recent students have, have looked into. Um, yeah, so uh, in our in our MA and in film and film cultures, um, we teach across uh, both the film department, but also modern languages. So that often affects um, the kind of breadth. We have a very strong kind of international uh, focus with our dissertations. So um, at the moment, we have students writing on, on topics kind of diverse as um, gender, well, feminism in, in girl and girls teen films since the 1980s. So, you know, kind of John Hughes, things like Easy A, um, citing the tropes and seeing how kind of feminism has developed alongside some some tropes that might initially seem like they're slightly patriarchal. Um, we, but then we have another student who is exploring um, fantasy as a genre and the kind of development of fantasy um, in terms of ideology in European, Eastern European cinema um, after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, so students are really allowed, are kind of able to explore quite individual and quite personal topics. Um, we also have somebody looking, um, doing a case study of kind of the success, the international success of the Chinese film Farewell My Concubine. So even in, in just kind of those three examples, you can see that we've got kind of a broad international focus. Uh, but we have some amazing and slightly kind of mad ideas as well. Um, I always love seeing what students come up with. So um, a few years ago, we had sort of masculinity and cyborgs in Hollywood cinema, which was great fun and exploring the kind of the way in which the the, the body is sort of um is is developed by technology and what that might tell us about attitudes towards masculinity and kind of really mainstream film um we've also had we also had a student um exploring a longer dissertation because like um like the english studies ma that that um emma mentioned we have two options for a dissertation so we either have a fifteen thousand word or a twenty five thousand word dissertation um and again it can set you up quite nicely for phd so we had um a student who explored um female representations in turkish cinema for one of the longer pieces and a few years before that somebody else did the the longer the, the 90 credit dissertation exploring the use of um how of kind of new technologies like phone technologies in filmmaking um and how that might offer kind of democratic potential in an industry where it's very quite really quite difficult to kind of um gain access so Topics are really different, but also the approaches as well. Um, we kind of cover quite a broad historical range and a broad international range as well. That's so amazing. really exciting work. Yeah, yeah. Really, really exciting, exciting work. work. Really, really good. And and I feel like um, maybe we can get onto this uh, very shortly, but actually maybe the students' own personal experiences, how do they bring their own kind of backgrounds and cultures and walks of life into the, some of those projects. We might want to explore that a little bit shortly. Um, but but firstly, um, Ahmed, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Could you maybe sort of share some of the recent um, topics or, or areas that students have studied? Um, yes, we've, um, our MA is called MA in Translation and Interpreting. So you can study both translation and interpreting modules or specialise in either. But um, if you're uh, looking at dissertation topics, as you can imagine, um, this is the nature of translation. So that our cohorts are usually multicultural and multilingual. They come from all sorts of life. You need to obviously have two languages, so your own language and another that you've learned. So um, we, we um, for the dissertation, you have two options. One of them is to write on a theoretical topic. And what the other option would be to carry out a translation yourself of a source text, a published source text. You translate about 10,000 words and then you write a, what we call a commentary or annotation. And the, an annotation is basically a discussion of the most interesting and the most challenging translation issues you've come across and how you've managed to deal with those. And that that option gives you the, the chance to try your hand out at translation yourself. 10,000 words is a, such a, a large piece of work, especially because your translation is very likely to be a couple uh, thousand words more. So you're talking about 12 to 13,000 words in translation. And um, then in the commentary, you write about cultural issues you've come across. You write about idioms, you write about um, metaphors. Recently, we had a student who was 
who liked poetry. So she basically selected a published uh, um, uh, collection of short poems. And then she carried out the translation herself. And then she wrote about the issues she um, uh, she came across and how she dealt with those and and how she managed to lose the rhyme in the original uh, source text, but she took to, uh, to um, focus on reproducing the meaning instead, because translating poetry is basically untranslatable, if you know what I mean. You can't reproduce the meaning and the form and the structure and the rhyme all in one go. It's very difficult if you're working across languages, of course. Uh, the um, So that option again gives uh, students a chance to try their hands at any genre. So we had students writing about um, NHS documents and how they are translated into various languages. We had students writing about what we call inter uh, community interpreting, which is basically interpreting for hospitals, interpreting for the police, interpreting for the UK border agency and, and so on. So people have been um, discussing things. One of the recent uh, dissertations was about how second uh, generation's children are used as interpreters for their parents. Um, and the pressure that places on them and things like that. Uh, we had, um, um, so the other option would be to write about, as I was saying, the, um, a theoretical topic of, of your choice. So uh, we had somebody writing about narrative theory and the narratives uh, circulating in the society about, uh, for example, in the media, this particular student wrote about narrat media narratives about Islam and Muslims using verses from the Quran. And um, um, that, that, that that was a very interesting topic. And then we had another student. These are very, very few examples because the MA in translation has been running for about 12, 13 years now. And every year we had loads of dissertations being written. So it's very difficult to kind of like give you um, a sense of what we do, before, but it's it's quite varied. It's like there is a broad range that we cover. Um, another example was um, a student a few years ago who was writing her MA dissertation about how to translate operas. So basically you translate to a rhyme and the rhythm and the song in, in the end. So um, I didn't supervise this particular one, but it was it looked very challenging with all the lines and all the drawings and all sorts of things. So um, I'll that's all for me for that, now. That's great. Thank you for sharing. Um, maybe this is more of a general discussion point if anyone would like to make any comments on this. Um, do, do you find that students bring those, you know, personal experiences, maybe experiences they've had in throughout their life, maybe cultural? Um, do you find that they bring those to their, their programmes and have that choice and freedom to be able to shape their titles using that? Is, is that yeah. for me? Yeah, yes, yeah, for, 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 for anyone who'd for like to make any okay. comments, really. Yeah, yeah, I can see everyone sort of nodding. So Emma, did you want to sort of take it first? Well, definitely. I mean, I think people say that you'll you'll be happiest in your job if you can make your hobby into a job. And I think a lot of people do the same with their dissertation. So, um, you know, I had a student once who was uh, her hobby was dancing and she looked at dance in literature. That was a brilliant dissertation because I think you, what's important is that you're passionate about your topic. It has to mean something for to you. Um, one of the students on the MA Modern and Contemporary Lit this year um, is Muslim and she's looking at Muslim women's poetry. So obviously, you know, that that has a very specific resonance for her. So, yeah, the, the personal topics are often the ones that are best because people are passionate about them. Absolutely. Yeah, it's that it's that passion. And again, I think we probably will talk about maybe some of the changes between doing some studying something at undergraduate level and postgraduate level and how maybe your motivations your passions changed we can touch upon that a bit later so thank you um claire or, or Ahmed, did you want to come in on, on on any of those points um i mean i would just say that yeah we do we do we both see kind of personal topics that um but also encourage it as well i think one of the one of the fantastic things about um for us we have a we have a quite an international cohort and historically our ma has been um has had a has a had a kind of broad international remit, and so it's not only you know that students get to explore something that interests them, but we might get 
exposed to topics and to films, what have you. You know, the student at the moment that's exploring Eastern European um, fan, fan, the kind of fantasy and really quite obscure and art house Eastern European films. Well, that's quite a long way from my interest in Hollywood. Um, I, I'm not supervising that project, but we have had presentations and it's just really interesting for us to learn. And I think um, we, with our dissertation as well, we, was, we have a, a kind of informal presentation so everybody gets to sort of talk about it with the, with the tutors. And it's a great way of, of kind of finding out what people's interests are um finding out what but for us to learn and also kind of creating that kind of sense of collegiality as well which i think is really important yeah that's that's a really great point to touch upon and actually something that's that's been a theme in other sessions as well as that two-way nature of postgraduate study yeah. um that totally. often those supervising students learn just as much about the student but also sometimes they they broaden their area as well so it's really really great to hear hear about that um just kind of moving things on perhaps to the direction that students might go once they've completed their masters um Obviously, there are a numerous sort of options, but did you want to maybe talk through a couple of um, avenues that, that maybe recent students have gone on to, uh, whether that be further study or, or, or going into the workplace? Um, maybe, Claire, did you want to follow up with that? To... Yeah, yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, so as I said before, we have we have quite an in, we have had quite an international cohort and actually there is a bit of a split um, between international students. It's not it's not sort of definitive, um, but where international students go and um, where home students go. So a lot of our home students do carry on for further study, study um, so to PhDs. Some of our international students do as well. I'm really proud that last year one of our one of our Chinese students graduated her PhD and I just anyone that's writing a PhD in their second language I think it just deserves a medal. I don't know how you manage to kind of you know write difficult academic work. Um, in, I can barely do it in English so how they how they do it in their second language is is, is beyond me. It's, it's such an achievement. Um, but we have so as well as further study, we've had a kind of diverse range. Some students, although we are, I think it's important to say we are a theoretical film studies degree, some students do manage to use that as a springboard um, because to work in media industries, because of course it does give you much more kind of knowledge um, of the history of the of how media works, of how we can analyse, and I think that's really important for people working in media industries. So one of our Chinese students a few years ago um, went back to China and worked for Jackie Chan's production company, which wow. is just huge. Yeah. Um, so that was like a massive success story, and I know that the MA definitely helped, and we've had a lot of student international students who might then take the qualification and return to their home country and and that use that as a kind of springboard to, to boost careers in media industries and tv um so really interestingly um avenue that a, a student took last year um they emailed to say that they started working for a charity called Medicinema, which I'd not heard of before, but it's absolutely fantastic um and they raise funds to put cinemas into hospitals for people that were long term Wow. Um, stay and put on events and, and film screenings and stuff so she's using her kind of knowledge of film in a, in a different way and in, in, to work for a charity um, that's very closely aligned with her interests so I think that's you know it's a really interesting outlets other students might go into um, and we have had students that have gone on to kind of college teaching um, to as I said to a lot of to PhDs and to funded PhDs with at Leicester or, or other universities so the, but also kind of using using their skills in something loosely related to film or the media industry. So it's a really broad range. And I mean, an MA is, is a higher degree, right? So it, it's sought after by employers, regardless of whether it's in your field. Absolutely. I can see Emma nodding away a lot there with, with what you're saying. And I think something that is, is really great um, that we're kind of discussing here is is breaking that misconception that, you know, often students, prospective students have that you, you study uh, um, your master's dissertation and your project and then you, you become such a specialized specialized individual that you're closing doors but actually uh, we find opposite. it's the, the opposite the opposite is true so Emma I can yeah. hand over to you yeah so a lot of people think that if you do a degree a BA or an MA in English that you're going to be a teacher some of our graduates do become teachers and that is a fantastic career but English is non-vocational and so people think it doesn't lead anywhere, but actually it leads everywhere. It can take you anywhere. And that's one of the strengths of the degree. So our MA graduates have gone into publishing, arts management, charity work, local government, the civil service, journalism, university professional services. Some have even joined the police and the armed forces. Um, some have retrained as accountants. Some have gone into law. Um, it can really take you anywhere because the skills that an English or and an arts graduate have 
are the ability to communicate effectively and the ability to think critically and creatively. And these are the two skill sets that every employer wants, whatever your job is. Just to give you one concrete example of um, a successful student, the student who wrote her dissertation on recipes in contemporary women's writing now edits the food magazine of a leading supermarket, the Waitrose Food Magazine. So she did manage to hook up what she wrote about with what she went on to do. But you don't have to. Absolutely. And do you find that, you know, you have some students, Emma, who go on to do further study and, and, and stay on for PhDs? Or do you find that, you know, you, you see people transitioning into the workplace? Both. Both. I mean, I'm, I already mentioned Sanem Alti, who did her mm. dissertation on the representation of Istanbul and is now doing a PhD on um, Turkish women writers. Mm. So she's an example. If you want to do a PhD, if you want to be an academic, then you have to do an MA. But an MA doesn't only lead to academia. It, it will enhance your employment prospects, whatever field you want to go into. Because so many people have a first degree and almost everybody has a 2-1 so you need something to distinguish you from the sea of undergraduates and an MA will ensure that your application goes straight to the top of the pile. Absolutely no that's really really great. Um, Ahmed I just want to bring you in on this conversation as well perhaps some, some sort of career destinations or journeys that students take once they finish their study with you. Um, as Claire was saying, a lot of our overseas students, and we have like a, usually a large um, number of those in our cohorts every year, they, um, they are keen on an MA because they actually want to follow that with a PhD after. And pretty much all of the ones who came to us, finished their MA, applied for PhDs and also managed to have their PhDs, went back home to wherever they come from, and they have academic positions that some of them are like have high flying jobs. One of them is a, a dean of education in a in a public university back uh, in Arab uh, in the Arab countries now. And uh, but uh, but that's that's not the only route. The other route for translation obviously is to practice as translator. And there's um, there's a, a demand for translators and interpreters um, in the UK and beyond. And it's growing because of all the migration, because of all the wars and uh, um, um, displacement of people, if you like. The other thing is also that um, uh, that requires not only simultaneous interpreting, but also the translation of documents. Uh, there is a job that kind of like um, appeared from the middle of nowhere because of people's moving is like they need someone to speak the language of migrants coming, for example, to the UK and particularly to Leicester and to meet the people, to show them how to do shop their shopping, how to do things, how to do to go about their daily life. And some of our own graduates have been doing this and they told me about this job. Um, others have been doing uh, uh, project management jobs. They work for translation and interpreting agencies. Um, some have been keen to go to places like the EU, for example, but you know, those who speak three languages, not just two. So the, the, we again, our graduates have been doing all sorts of things, either practical translation or academia and teaching future translation interpreters themselves and so on. That's great. Honestly, such a wide range of directions for students to take. And it is, again, just emphasising that point that those doors open for you after you've done your master's study. Uh, and really, you can then begin to shape your career in, in various different ways um, yes. from there, which, which is really lovely to hear about those specific examples. Alicia, it's also yes. worth mentioning that people with an MA earn more than people yes, with a BA. They do, yeah. So I think yeah. I think the best reason to do an MA is because you want to, because you're passionate about it, but it will bring material benefits. Absolutely. No, that's a really, really good point to mention, Emma, as well. I saw some data the other day that can kind of quantify some of that. So it's, you know, it's it's worth mentioning, especially because you're investing in yourself when you're taking on that master's qualification. Um, so, so thank you for sharing that. Um, so I wanted to maybe talk a bit more about Leicester specific elements to, to sort of some of our courses. And are there any really great links that, you know, our courses have with research that's taking place at the forefront of your schools? So Emma, did you want to kind of pick up on that? Yeah, well, I could give a couple of my own examples, uh, yeah. examples from my own research. Um, so I work on a a, a, a writer who comes from, came from Leicester called Joe Orton, a, a 1960s playwright. And the university owns the Joe Orton Archive, which is a fantastic research resource. Um, and um, 
I have been involved, my research has led to two exhibitions this year, one in Amsterdam about LGBT mental health and one which is currently on a New York uh, Museum and Art Gallery in Leicester, the city's museum, on punk because um, Joe Orton had a significant influence on the punk movement that came after him. And um, students have been, have had some involvement in in the, the punk project specifically in terms of um, the actual kind of material practice of putting the exhibition together. So that's been fun. That sounds amazing. That does sound really fun. And to, to be involved with that as part of your, your research and then obviously your supporting students on their courses it's that it's that interlinking I mean I'm, I don't know maybe if you find that students sort of come along to those exhibitions participate uh, attend and, and really feel engaged with that process as well yeah absolutely and I think that students often feel inspired by projects that that the tutors are working on like Claire's great conference um, so we're publishing we're engaged in we organize conferences we're organizing events and you know, the students around us are part of that process and they're invited to be part of it and to join us in those events. So Absolutely, we have a great yeah. research culture at yeah. Leicester. There's a great environment for being an MA student. Definitely, yeah, no, I, that, that's great. Go so on, I was say, if I come on, no, jump come on in, in, yeah. Jump in there and obviously Emma mentioned the conference that I organised and although we didn't have students um, involved in the organising of the conference, the MA students did come along um, and it was absolutely fantastic. Um, it was really good to see them engaged in, in an academic event and actually we were quite a small, we were just a sort of small one day event, um, but it meant that they got the opportunity to speak to more established and esteemed scholars, um, like a, a pr big professor in the field, who was wonderfully kind of generous with their time and advice. Um, so actually the, these events, as, as Emma said, we have a fantastic research culture, um, lots of seminars within the school as well as these kind of bigger events, but it does offer an opportunity for, for students to maybe the, the research isn't always linked to the, the course, but to get engaged in a research culture and to be inspired by it. And I think that's why as well, we have quite a lot of students that do continue to PhD because they do feel inspired by the environment at Leicester. Um, I think we're a very kind of welcoming and collegiate school for doing that. Definitely. Ahmed, did you want to kind of come in and, you know, on the back of that um, in terms of research that's taking place? Uh, yeah, there are two things that happened to me on, on the research front with respect to MA students. I um, I used to teach this module on translation strategies. It's basically an introduction to how to spot translation issues and how to uh, deal with these issues. And um, I taught that to multilingual, multicultural groups for a few years. And in the end, they actually asked me to put this together in the form of a book, and which I actually did. And the book came out um, in uh, end of April, this April. Uh, gone. So it it's called the translation um, Arabic English Arabic literature translation issues and strategies. While I discuss Arabic examples, the book can actually be used by other language pairs. And again, one of the um, one of the MA students in the past, she read a paper of mine, and she was inspired about narrative theory, and she was inspired by it, and she wrote her MA on this. And when she finished, she came back and she asked me to work together on a book, and we actually published the book on the topic. Um, uh, she 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 has Italian and Spanish, and I have Arabic and English, and we actually put together a book about narrative circulating these four languages. And it came out in 2021 on the outreach as well. That's really so, great. Um, so the, the 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 boundaries are for us really between when we inspire them and when they inspire us. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, the key word that, that's come out of this sort of part of the conversation, that I think Emma mentioned, is that community feeling. And again, this has come across in other sessions really nicely, is that when you're undertaking postgraduate study, the dynamic that you maybe had when you're an undergraduate student is, is sometimes different to how it is in a postgraduate sense. And you do have that sense of community. Um, you have that sense of more independence um, in your in your knowledge base, but also that ability to learn from people around you as well, um, especially in sort of networking events, conferences. These are all things we We've touched upon. Um, did anyone else kind of want to showcase any field trips or, or events or, or symposiums? I know Emma you're putting lots of lovely things yeah. in the chat so. I've just put a link in the chat to the annual creative writing lecture which is um, an event that's of particular interest to creative writing students but it's open to everybody in the university so all students, all MA students are encouraged to go and it's open to the public as well. And we have leading writers come to that and give a lecture about their work every year. This year we had Val McDermott, she was brilliant. 
But that for, for creative writing students, there's a program of visiting speakers where creative writing students have the chance to workshop their own work again with really eminent writers. And although those seminars are for creative writing students, again, they're open, they're open to everybody. And that's another great opportunity. Yeah, such a such a great opportunity. And it is so sometimes about those external networking links that learning from the sector and not necessarily even just within institutions. So so thank you for sharing them. Claire or, or Ahmed, did you have anything you wanted to share that may be similar to that or? We in translation studies, we do have um, um, a weekly seminar series throughout the year. Um, so we bring in speakers, we bring in pra practition, uh, pr uh, uh, practicing or practicing translators, if you like. Um, so they talk about the journey to the students, how they set themselves up as agencies, how they set themselves up as uh, professional translators and interpreters. We have um, a bridge building event where we bring um, ITI representative, Institute of Translators and Interpreters representative in the regional representative in Leicester. We bring speakers, we, we bring uh, translation agencies um, that talk to our students about the internship opportunities they have. We've had this event only a couple of weeks back and also last week we had our annual lecture uh, by a um, very well-known professor in the area of translation interpreting, Anthony Pym. So there is always events um, outside, taking place outside the classroom. It's not just academic work that is taking place. It's not only translation interpreting practice, but it also talks about how to set yourself up as a translator, as an interpreter. Um, we we bring in um, established speakers, translators, interpreters, for them to see how this takes to the students to see how this takes place and how they can be established in the interpreters one day. Yeah, that's great. And again, showing some of those links to, to developing that network for your, your future as well. So that's yes. really great. Claire, did you maybe have any kind of sort of things that to, to mention here? Um, so, I mean, obviously, we, you know, sort of research seminars are something that run across mm. all our subject areas. So I don't kind of want to repeat in that term. But actually, one of the ways in which research um, is kind of integrated is also um, in, in our approaches, actually, one of the things that we offer on our MA, which I think is quite unique, um, is one of our modules that is really in keeping with some of the research methods used in our school. So this is a way of thinking about how research, we're not just a research culture, but research informs the teaching as well. So when our MA in film and film cultures, we have a module in semester one, which is called Approaches to Cinema History, which I think it's it's been kind of praised by sort of external um, reviewers of our, of our module and students really um, engage strongly with it. Where we look at primary sources material. Um, so it's actually looking at things like shooting scripts um, or, you know, like call sheets and thinking about how we can understand um, um, kind of film history through the ephemera, through these kind of primary sources and students actually get to, to kind of work with some of these um, some of these kind of artifacts um, and that's in that's in keeping with with the kind of research methods of one of our professors professor james chapman who is who teaches that module um and who who uses a lot of primary source material and archive material so this is not thinking so much about the kind of research culture but actually how the research is informing and i and i mean i know that it, it, all of our teaching is research informed across all the all the degree programs but um for us i think that's one module where it's it's, it's quite exciting that actually students get to do something a little bit different um which both sets us apart from kind of undergraduate study um, but also looks at kind of ways that you can they actively are being researchers you know they are actively dealing with these materials and I think that's a really exciting module that we offer on the program. Building on that could I also mention the work of my colleague um, Claire Wood who has recently won a national prize for her research which um, involves decoding some of Dickens writing. Charles Dickens wrote in shorthand and some of his code has never been decoded, never been understood. And Claire set up a project inviting people all over the world to try and break the code and her MA students got involved in that. So there's an example of how MA students can be actively involved in, re in a research project that is completely groundbreaking, a global international award-winning research project. Um, and on a more uh, closer to home, I'd also like to mention the, um, the there's a research seminar for postgraduate students. And so MA students have the opportunity to present a paper on their own research that they do as part of the MA. 
And it's also a great way to connect MA students with PhD students. Absolutely. No, that's great. And again, part of that support network, which is something I'd just like to maybe touch upon um, before, you know, I can see we're, we're coming fairly close towards the end of the session. But I'm thinking maybe you can talk a little bit about support and, and perhaps um, the role of perhaps personal tutors within schools um, and, and dissertation supervisors and things like that. So, Ahmed, did you want to come in on, on, on maybe any experiences you've had as as part of that support? Uh, could you? Sorry, I was I was distracted sorry, with no, posting these two links. Yeah. To the so we're just about talking about <laughs> we're just talking no, about kind of support and, and maybe personal tutor systems. Um, how how students kind of access maybe pastoral or academic support in their programs. Oh yes, we we've uh, usually we have um, um, a, a member of staff from the transition so the team, for example, acting as a, a personal tutor for the the cohort. A personal tutor is a person who's supposed to be an academic and to be there for you if you wanna discuss any issues, any personal issues, any academic issues um, you can't cope with on your own. So if you're struggling to time management, for example, uh, your study, then they will be able to speak to you and point you out to the right direction and things like that. If you have any issues, like we've had students in the past talking about um, like issues in the accommodation um, area and so on, and then we were able to advise them. Students who are not Coping with the um, level of, of engagement required at MA level because they have come from a different system. So we were there for them, supporting them, meeting them on one to one, um, um, confidentially, of course, to help them, you know, get on top of things and stay on top of their work and, and so on. So all our MAs have this support system. Even our BA students have the same thing as well, have access to a member of staff who works with them closely on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, and then this is kind of like available through our day for MA students as well. That's great, thank you. And, and Emma, I guess this maybe lends to some of the things you just touched on with that support from, from PGRs as well. Do they kind of get involved with that? And are your experiences similar to, to, to Ahmed's? In terms of student support? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's worth stressing that the university has a wide range of support systems um, and it's the job of the personal tutor to really direct students to those so there's support within the department um, and in, a, across the university if time's short i think i'd maybe like to focus more on the really what i think are the kind of key features of of studying at leicester yeah. um, so it's worth stressing that um, for example, in English, at all of our students, 100% of the students graduated with a merit or a distinction last year. So we take good students, we offer excellent teaching, we have fantastic support services, and the result is that our students thrive. They do really, really well. And um, I also wanted to let you know that Leicester is one of the strongest institutions in the country for arts and humanities. We're really, really good at arts and humanities. And English was recently ranked 11th in the country uh, for research. So if you come to Leicester to do your degree, we can guarantee that you will be, you'll be taught by the best people in the field. That's great. Yeah, that's they're really great things to share. Um, Claire, did you have anything you wanted to kind of to add and add to this conversation? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I would, and it kind of ties the two things we've just been talking about together, actually. So our programme, we're not a huge master's programme. We are, we tend to have, you know, quite a sort of small, but therefore a tight-knit cohort. What I would say is that we really are, um, it, is, it is really a supportive and, and a kind of um, nurturing environment for, for scholars, really. Um, I think that's what's great about our, all of our MA programmes in, in the school. What I certainly see in our um, in our MA is that um, because we tend to be quite small and we are a small, the film the film department history of art and film department is is quite a small department in or section of of, of the university. Um, our students get to know us. They know that the door is open, so they will have a personal tutor. But a lot of the time, as well, because I'm I'm the director of the program, I'll have students that will say, "Oh, can I come and talk to you about ideas, about maybe PhD, about what's next?" Um, and my door's always open and. And I think that what we've managed to create is a really 
close-knit community where students support one another and where, where they know that we are there to support them. So yes, we've got excellent academic credentials, um, but I know that one of the things that we get repeatedly is that students just feel like they're really welcomed, that they're really supported and that it is a friendly environment. And that makes a massive difference, yeah. particularly if you are traveling internationally, you just want to know that you're going to be somewhere where you're looked after. And I think that we do that. So that's what I would add as a kind of, you know, that's what we do really well. That's a great point, Claire. One word that comes up time and time again in student feedback is friendly. Yeah. That um, Leicester is a really friendly city. We're a friendly university and we're a friendly department. We really Absolutely. Are. Yeah, I think those things link really well in, into one another in that, you know, that support package and then the academic achievements, they complement themselves so, so well. So, um, yeah, thank you for really sharing that. Um, I think we'll take sort of the next sort of five to 10 minutes, maybe talking about some of the differences between studying at undergraduate level and, and postgraduate level. I'm often asked, but what what's life like? What's my day to day like? How do I sort of manage my time as a as a postgraduate student um, so maybe if we could spend a bit of time unpicking some of that I don't know if Emma if you wanted to lead on this thank you um, it's a really good question as one students always ask I think the main difference between undergraduate and postgraduate study is that an MA involves greater level of independence so there's fewer contact hours but that doesn't mean there's fewer study hours it just means there's more self-directed study there are no lectures, no formal lectures. It's all seminar based teaching in English anyway. And there are no exams. Um, that's those are some key differences. The pass mark is slightly higher. The pass mark is 50 percent rather than 40 percent. So there are some key differences between undergraduate and postgraduate study. Uh, but the main one is that students need to be really motivated because al although there's lots of support, you, ne you need to be driven, you need to be committed, you need to want to do it. We won't, we'll support you, but we won't push you. That's great. Does that kind of lend itself well to students having flexibility with their time in terms of managing what they study when, what they read when? I can see you're nodding yeah, along. Yeah, I'll, I'll, Maybe I'll come, come in here. In. Yes, it does. Yeah. So we have, I mean, we have part time and full time options for our for our degree program. It's important to say that as well because um, one of the one of the differences I think you'll find at master's level is also the the makeup of the student group. We have more mature students. We have more students that come, you know, from the workplace. And, um, we have, as we've all said, a kind of big international cohort as well. So um, the students come from different walks of life. You'll you'll you won't it won't just be kind of you know people who are generally the sort of 18 to 21 as we have on our undergraduate degrees um, and therefore yes there is a flexibility that recognizes people might have roles as kind of carers as parents they will have part may well have part-time jobs as well there is a flexibility um you're normally in sort of two two to three days i think um it's normally across two days for our program but we don't necessarily kind of we can't make guarantees about timetabling at this stage um but the i, I would definitely um, echo what Emma said. It, the emphasis once you get to postgraduate is your research, it's your time. You are doing a lot of the, the work. You, you will have um, longer seminars um, in which you'll kind of discuss closely, but it really is designed to be much more student led. Therefore, the emphasis is on you to do kind of reading. And hopefully you've chosen a master's because you're excited about the topic. And therefore, this this isn't a hard, it isn't a hardship, I don't think, to read around your subject. But that is, I think that is the thing that perhaps students are sometimes surprised by is the amount of kind of extra reading and extra preparation that is expected of you. But um, you, as, as, as Emma said, you do so in a supportive environment. If, you, if you're struggling with it, you ask someone. If you're not sure where to look for things, you ask someone. Um, but yeah, that, that's kind of the, the biggest change. Um, but an exciting change as well. It gives absolutely. you much more autonomy. Yes, yes, it absolutely does. And I think um, a couple of the other sessions have sort of described that that undergraduate phase is you're very much a sponge. You're sort of taking in lots and lots of information. Um, but when you're in that postgraduate phase, you're really developing and you're developing your knowledge. Um, so it is that that is, is much more autonomy involved with it. Um, Ahmed, did you want to kind of come in and uh, your experience is similar with students on your programmes? Yeah, it's it's uh, very much similar, really. I mean, we I mean, we had, students, uh, we had the students coming from the background of an undergraduate where they were like sort of like spoon fed everything and there was very little space for self-independence or anything like this and in and, and translation studies from once from from day one as soon as they start we ask them to choose their own text to choose to 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 uh, to translate and uh, to choose a the text they want to interpret for example 
and then we tell them this is the first step. We want you to be able to choose for yourself what you want to read, what you want to translate, and to try to hand out as many genres in as many genres as you as you possibly can for um, during the first semester and the second semester, so that once you had summer and it's about time to write your dissertation, you know exactly what you're doing. So um, we try also to put our teaching together in two days, um, if possible, but also for mature students who are unable to commit two days um we, we've got the um, option of part-time study that's for uh, students who are able or wanting to study at uh, a master's in translation over two years and then just one year but for those who are able to commit they can finish within one year and again there's a lot of i tell them it's at, at 12 um, months year it's not there is no holidays during the year there's absolutely no time and i don't use the word holiday with them and i say this is this is the reading week. It's called the reading week because it's a reading week. It's not a holiday week because you're supposed to be doing reading. And then in, so in December, I say this is the exam uh, break. This is not a holiday again because you're going home to do your uh, work. We don't have exams. We have uh, coursework. So you finish your semester. You have time three or four weeks off. Again, off from contact hours, but on to reading hours and writing your coursework, submitting your coursework. There's absolutely no holidays, but it it, it gives you a great sense of um, commitment and a great sense of achievement in the end that you've been able to put in 12 months worth of work, submit them, um, a larger dissertation. The area of translation this is about 20,000 words. And it's uh, the feeling because I've, I've been there myself. I've, I've done my master's degree. I come from a, an uh, overseas background myself, and it gave me the greatest sense of achievement to be able to organize myself, to organize my time and time management uh, is, is a fantastic and, uh, and, um, and a very um, important skill that you have to have, not only for the masters, but for working later on. And then we kind of like nurtured this from day one in the MA. Absolutely. I think that really ties in nicely with what Claire was saying as well, that, you know, you're on that pursuit of knowledge and hopefully it's something that you feel so passionate about that, you know, really it becomes an enjoyable um, part of that. Yes, there are challenges, of course, because this is postgraduate study, but enjoy that process whilst you're going along with it. So so thank you for sharing those experiences. Um, so we are sort of drawing the session towards the end, but I really wanted to ask about one thing that continues to amaze you or inspire you in your area of expertise. This is really just a chance for our audience to, to hear from you about something that you just think is truly wonderful in your area. So um, Emma, shall I hand over to you? Wow, what a great question. I mean, I, I do this and I continue to do this because I think that I'm really passionate about literature and I believe that literature has the capacity to change the world. And so all of the work that I engage in, my own research and the research that I see our MA students doing is often geared towards wanting to challenge some existing ideas or to change the way that people people see and understand the world. That's lovely. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Clara, I'm going to hand over to you. Um, I don't, my answer wasn't isn't anywhere as eloquent as, as uh, Emma's. Well, I mean, obviously, I think I think for me, film I think can can do something very similar. But I'm I'm amazed if we're thinking in the particular context of MA and our students by the vastness of the field, by the various ways that we can engage with something that is so embedded in our everyday lives, film and television, um, but actually the ways that we can analyse, we can understand, we can historicise, we can think about the kind of structures of the industry, we can analyse the text. I just, I, I'm constantly um, excited by the vastness, the, the opportunities, the challenges to, to really learn more. Amazing, no, I love that as well. And, and Ahmed, over to you. Uh, I'm just going to answer this from a completely different perspective. Uh, what, what continues to amaze me is actually the transformation that is that I see taking place in our students' lives, knowledge, background, ma maturity from when they between when they start and when they finish. I mean, I I look at at look their writing. We have, we offer them the opportunity to write like um kind of like formative essays when they first start, and I compare this to their level when they write the dissertation submitted in twelve. It's, it, twelve months is not a long time, is it? But the transformation is massive. And this is this terminate to the kind of like work we do, the, the 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 work they do themselves as well, the reading, the engagement, the enjoyment above all. Um, 
that they get out of studying their MA. So I, I could that continues to amaze me every year, like the That's, transformation yeah. between the beginning and the end of the year. Great yeah. answer. Agreed. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, I can see Emma and Claire really nodding along in agreement. It's so, so nice to see you all kind of seeing from the same hymn sheet and feeling that 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 pride for your students as well. So um, I have got one very sort of final question, but I'll give you a moment to think about it, which is to really sum up master's study at the University of Leicester in in one or two words or a very short sort of sentence. I know um, we've spoken about some of your personal um, amazing sort of achievements, but to sum up master's study uh, in one or two words, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a moment to do that and I'm going to share some information on, our, on my screen um, just to make our viewers aware of a couple of bits and pieces. Um, so in terms of what's next, um, these PG spotlights have been taking place from the 5th to the 9th of June, so all along this week. Um, and if you have missed any, the recordings will be out soon on YouTube to catch up on any maybe that you've missed, or if you'd like to rewatch and revisit them, um, you can find out more about other subjects um, today, uh, rather than the ones today as well. Um, it's worth saying that applications for our postgraduate courses are open and we would really recommend that you apply sooner rather than later if you're looking for September or October 2023 entry. Um, please kind of look into those key deadlines on our course pages. You'll find all of that information on each course page located in sort of a big box um, towards the middle of that. On there, you'll also see entry requirements, funding and scholarship options too. So if you scan the QR code on the screen, um, you'll be able to take be taken to our postgraduate pages um, where you can also find out information um, about all these other topics too. There's also a function to chat to our students and staff um, so you can send a message to one of our friendly ambassadors um, ask them kind of anything whether that's about the city of Leicester accommodation um, how they find how they're finding their course and um, there will also be some student blogs available for you to watch on there too. So that's kind of my little bit. I'm going to hand back to our panel now for their kind of one or two words um, to sum up master's study at the University of Leicester. So Claire, we'll, we'll, get, we'll kick things off with you. Um, so I'd probably go for, I know Emma said it earlier, but friendly definitely is kind of yeah. top of the list, but um, friendly and inspiring is how I would say. Leicester. That's lovely. Thank you. Emma, over to you. Hopefully Claire's not pinched your word. <laughs> Revelatory. Come to Leicester and we will show you new worlds. Um, revelatory and exciting lovely thank you and then ahmed for the for the last couple of words for the session um it's a great sort of knowledge it's a great opportunity if you have it don't miss it and um you you you, you will enjoy it definitely Lovely, thank you. So the last thing for me to do is just to thank our panel so much today. So Emma, Ahmed, Claire, thank you so much for joining me with this discussion. Thank you also to our attendees for watching. Um, as I said, these will be being recorded, so, so please feel free to watch them back um, at a later date. So thank you so much, everybody. Have a lovely day um, and yeah, goodbye. Thanks, Alicia. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone.